welcome to Research in Focus again. I'm Gretchen Huizinga, and right now we're talking to two researchers who are working on a revolutionary storage solution for computer storage in the zettabyte era. We have Ant Rostrin, who's a principal researcher and the deputy lab director at MSR in Cambridge, England, and Andromachi Chatsilaftiriu, who is a postdoc researcher in systems and networking, also at the Cambridge Lab. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So you're both working on a really interesting project um, called Project Silica. And it's in the research stage right now, but it's, it's just fascinating what you're doing. So Ant, in broad strokes, tell us what it is. Give us an elevator pitch of Project Silica. Okay, so, so Project Silica is really looking at how do we build a new storage system for the cloud era from, this, from the ground up. So rather than starting with existing components like tape or hard disk drives, we're looking at a new, new type of storage media, glass. And um, what's happened recently, and it was a breakthrough at the University of Southampton, was they discovered how to uh, write data into this glass. And we have been um, trying to both uh, use that and develop it further, and then build an entire storage system based upon, upon that. And that's what Project Silica is trying to do. Andromachi, what's changed in the magnitude of the data landscape that we're dealing with today that would prompt research on a completely new storage medium, if you will? And what are the limitations that we're facing in the current technologies? So the amount of data that we need to preserve for a long time has increased dramatically over the last uh, few years. Yeah. So we expect that uh, within the foreseeable future, we, we expect the storage needs to, in, to reach uh, a few zettabytes of data. So we need a massive storage system able to sustain all this data. And that's the target of this project. So, so what's the, what is the current structure limitation that we would need to go into a different medium? So first of all, uh, none of the existing storage technologies that are currently deployed in the, in the data centers have been originally designed for the cloud. Right. So we need something specifically designed for this environment and uh, cost is a critical factor and uh, also we need to be able to sustain high performance, right? Right. So the existing te technologies, think about it, uh, if you, when we are talking about cold data storage, uh, the alternative solutions include uh, hard disk drives and uh, tapes. Uh, both provide low cost per gigabyte, but um, if you want to store a zettabyte uh, of data, you need millions of hard disks, yeah. of one, uh, 15 terabyte disks in order to store all this data. And the cost is prohibitive. And think about it, it's not only about storing the data, you need every five to 10 years, you need to migrate the data to the next generation medium in order to be able to store this data durable over time. So we need a new storage solution in yeah. order to meet these challenges. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, that's one of the great things about glass is that once you've written the data in the glass, it will last for a long time. I mean, right. think millions of years. So if you think of these other technologies, once you've written to them, it, it you know, be three years or 10 years for tape, three years for hard disk drives, you have to copy it off and copy it onto the next one. With this technology, once you've done it, it just sits there. It doesn't require any power. It doesn't require any special environment in particular. You just keep the glass there. And when you need to read the data again, you, just, you can just bring it in and read it, or you can just access it and read it. Right, so, so in that line, I've heard words like revolutionary, transformational, stunning, applied to this particular technology. How does it work? So, so we fire uh, femtosecond lasers into the glass and you sort of fa effectively focus the laser at a position in the glass. And when you fire the laser in, you generate a small structure, which we call a voxel, and that's what you use to um, actually encode the data inside the glass. Mm -hmm. And then once you've written the data, uh, you then also need to be able to read the data to be able to get the data back out. So we have, um, we have effectively developing systems which allow us to read the data back out from the glass. And one of the things that's very different about this is there are many, many layers. You can think of sort of uh, a piece of glass as having multiple layers of data through it. Now, if you take something like a traditional optical disc used in a DVD or Blu-ray type of system, at the limit that might have four layers or eight layers. Uh, these can potentially have hundreds of layers. And so you need techniques that let you be able to read the data from deep within the glass and um, be able to accurately extract out the information 
that you've stored uh, in the glass. And so you've already kind of gone through this and research and say, hey, this works? We're, 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 getting, we're getting close. We can, um, you know, almost every week we're improving performance dramatically. Um, at the moment, we're at about 75 layers that we can read, which is a huge step forward from where we were, uh, which was around 20 layers before Christmas. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're making great progress. And um, the technology is maturing rapidly from the stage where it was sort of like a large room in Southampton to the stage where we can start to think what it might look like as it goes into a data center. Interesting. So what challenges have you faced in the research of this new technology and how have you, how have you resolved the challenges? One of the main challenges is uh, how we can drive the bit density of this new storage medium up. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think about the technical challenges, uh, the ways, some of the ways in which we can increase the density is, for instance, increase the number of layers or we can uh, reduce the spacing between these nanostructures inside the, uh, the glass. However, both approaches result, result in increased noise, and uh, this complicates the readout process. Sure. So it's not actually straightforward, no. uh, and we are uh, working on that. We've made uh, great progress within the lab. and uh, But it's something that you're still working on to try to yeah, resolve that. Yeah. And yeah. I think you've got to think, you know, it took the hard disk drive industry about 40 years yeah, yeah, from the point exactly. when they first started to the point where now, where they've kind of reached the uh, plateau of what they can do on aerial density and are looking at other techniques to improve performance. And, um, you know, we, we, so we, you know, at the limit, if, if you took a DVD sized sort of piece of glass, uh, Southampton, I uh, believe you can get about 360 terabytes inside a piece of glass. But, you know, it will take us many, many years to get there. And at the moment, sure. our challenge is to get the first, you know, to get it to a density where it's sort of competitive with existing things. Once we get beyond that point, everything is then a win up to the 360. So at this point, it's still at the phase where it's, you know, this is still better. The old technologies are still better or? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're at the point where we're starting to catch up with where they are. And, um, you know, as, I, as we sort of say, every, every week or every month, we're making a great step forward. So we expect very soon. You know, most, most technology exists on an S-curve. Sure. And in a sense, we're at the start of this S-curve. So we make yeah. a lot of, we make a, you know, we, we're, or at least we're at the start of the bit where it's beginning to grow. So yeah. we're starting to see the progress. We spent a lot of time getting infrastructure, understanding the technology, making it repeatable. And now we're beginning to really so sort of tame it. The and, upside um, is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk about the design challenges. I was interested in some of the things you were saying about how you have to conceptualize yeah. a brand new technology for storage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's exciting in this project is that we are building a completely new storage system from the ground up. So we are not limited by form fra factors similarly to the previous right. storage technologies. So we can explore alternative shapes, alternative sizes for the glass medium. Sure. So Everything is open and uh, we are following a data-driven design and we are trying to understand what's the optimal design in order to get a system that can maximize the performance and minimize the cost. Right. So Ant, give us a little bit of an overview of what you called hot, cool, and cold data storage needs. We've talked uh, about the context of how and where we store things, when we need to access and how, and how does Project Silica address that whole system. Yeah, so, so you know, if you think of the data that you're accessing frequently, you know, if we think of taking photographs, the photographs that you're taking today, you're probably looking at and accessing frequently, so that would be considered sort of hot data. Data that's, act and then as you access the data less frequently, so, you know, if you think of photographs that you took a month ago, you perhaps access them, but nowhere near as frequently as the ones you took uh, yesterday. And then, of course, the ones that you took five or six years ago, you probably never access, and um, they're, they're cold. So we start to have hot data, which is used frequently, warm data, which is sort of accessed uh, fairly frequently, but not too frequently, and then cold data. And you know, the vast majority of data that's stored is actually cold. And uh, that's the kind of data that we're trying to store in, and service with Project Silica. And one of the challenges is, if you look at most storage technologies, as they reduce cost to, in order to store these technologies, they also increase access latency. And one of the advantages of being able to design something from the ground up is that we can really say, well, we have ideas about exactly how long people were willing to wait for their, for their cold data. Can we build a system that can give us that kind of access latency? If you think of something like tape, you've got to spool the tape, you've got to get the tape there, 
you've got to find the right point, you've got to take it back out before you can use it and so forth. And so there's a lot of latency in the system. And so you know, this is one of the challenges we're trying to address to make it so that even though it's cold data, accessed infrequently, you don't have to pay a really high penalty to access it. Yeah, and that brings up a question that I, I'm curious about in terms of you know, accessing that data. I want to find a picture that I took five years ago and it's been in my cold storage system, as, as it were. Um, it, does Project Silica present any accessibility strategies for me when I'm going, where was that picture that I took of my daughter when she was at camp that year? Yeah, no, so, so we would call that sort of metadata that you would store. Sure. So we, we, don't, we don't provide any services metadata. We have other services around which will, which will provide the metadata. You know, you can have a machine learning pipeline that looks at the pictures as they go in and tags them with words and then stores that in a system that you can search. And um, all, all we're really worried about is how do you store the data and how do you store it efficiently mm -hmm. and at low cost for long term. Sure. Sort of storage forever. So, so as you're part of the team at Microsoft Research, um, are there any other teams writ large that you're dealing with um, as you develop this new storage system? Yeah, we have a great collaboration with Azure Storage and uh, we are learning uh, from them about uh, how this can be deployed actually in the data center. Sure. And uh, actually we also Given that we are following a data-driven design, uh, the properties of the current workload are really important to us, right? Yeah. So they are also helping us with uh, this part. And Great. We are excited. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really interested in what this looks like. I have visions in my head of all kinds of form factors, as you <laughs> mentioned, for what the glass looks like. Do you have a piece of glass with you that we could look yeah, at? Yeah, I do have one okay, piece well, of glass. Okay, show it to me. So it's, uh, can you see the little dots? There you go. So those are the, the media written, the voxels yeah. written yeah, into the glass. The structures written in the glass yeah. using the femtosecond laser. Yeah. Wow. So, so each one of those dots that you can see is actually uh, hundreds or thousands of voxels. So they're placed very close together, and then there's a set of them uh, that you can see on here. So, so the dots that I see there, what is that, and how many layers are there? So. In this particular summary, we have uh, around 25 layers, no, 25 layers, right? And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's an older assembly. It happens uh, to carry it with me, and currently we are able to write up to 75 layers wow. and read them back. Yeah. That's fascinating. So here's a video that shows how one of our early prototype read heads reads data from the piece of glass. On the right-hand side, you could see the, the piece of glass in there, and you can see those little, little uh, collections of voxels that we've just shown you in the piece of glass here, and you can see the head moving over it. And on the left-hand side, you can see the picture of each, what we call, sector as you move across those sets of voxels. And then in a second, it will stop, and it will go down through the glass, and you'll see 20 layers of voxels, each one coming into focus, going out, coming in, going out, coming in, going out. Beautiful. So let's say you're wildly successful. Project Silica uh, ramps up, hits that curve going up, and um, it's, it's deployed widely. What, is the, what does the future look like? So I, I think it's really exciting. So at one level, the number of bytes that will be stored in glass will be ginormous. So if you think about it as the technology that will, do, will, will store most of the data, because most of the data is cold, so uh, you know, we would expect a large amount to move on to it. It also has a great property that it's, it's very low cost, which means that you no longer need to worry about the data that you're storing and how much it's going to cost you, because the cost will be much, much lower than today's technologies. And the other thing is, you know, for many things, we actually worry about losing them. And yeah. you know, if you think of uh, sometimes films or sometimes TV series that were done early, uh, you know, years ago, we've lost them because they decayed. The great thing about this is this provides a media that once you've written to it, it doesn't have any bit rot, it doesn't decay, you can put it in water, you can heat it, um, you, can, you can really abuse it and then still effectively read it. And so the chances of actually losing something that's written in it is really low. And of course, you know, if you think of things like tablets and uh, cavemen actually uh, yeah. chipping away on stone walls, you know, <laughs> this has pr proven to be a very effective way of storing stuff. And in effect, that's what we're doing. We're changing it in a way which is, which is structurally changing the glass, and it will not decay or rot or anything else. Now, a lot of people think of medieval windows and think, ah, oh, the glass will, you know, but, but you know, that glass was very impure. Sure. We use just pure quartz glass. And um, 
so it, so it, it won't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't do what a medieval window does. Sure, <laughs> that's good news. Interesting question from a data generation point of view. I take a lot of pictures. I don't care anymore. I used to care with, when it was on film because I had to pay to get that done. Now my, my phone is full of pictures, most of which I don't even care about. There's 20 of the same thing. Um, is there any effort in, in talking to people about not generating so much data? Or is that even, you know, you're just saying, hey, they're going to, so we're going to make this. No, you cannot uh, you can't. prevent the evolution, right? It's, uh, <laughs> especially with our new phones and cameras, and you want to capture each moment, and it's very hard to control that. So the, the amount of data will keep increasing, and we need a way to store this data durably. That's great. You know, I mean, that's the point. You can't socially engineer the populace to not do what they're doing with the technologies that they have. That's right. So you have to. And you know, with things like you know autonomous vehicles coming online and things like this, you know, cameras, cameras oh, generate exactly. a huge amount of data. And um, you know, I, you know, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting that I think in the past you often don't know the value of something. Um, if you, you know, ten years ago you might have taken four or five photos of a whiteboard, and then discarded all of them except for one. Right. You know, today, using machine learning techniques, you can take multiple fit photos of the same whiteboard and then use them to create a higher fidelity photo. Now, of course, 10 years ago, you didn't know that would be possible. So those four pictures that you had then had no value, so right. you binned them. And that's one of the things that, you know, we don't want people to need to necessarily make choices about which data they keep because today they can perceive the value. It's cheap enough that you can store all data, and so if in the future it becomes valuable because of innovations in I mean, machine learning, you can exploit it without having to worry that you've actually lost some of the information that was needed. That's fascinating. It's that record now, exploit later. You don't necessarily know what's going to be valuable till later. Yeah. And then you go, I wish I had that. I wish I didn't yeah. throw it away. Yeah. Like those shoes I kept from high school, <laughs> 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 which aren't valuable. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see where this work is going. Really, this is transformational research going on in the Cambridge lab. We're excited that you guys came to share with us today. Ant and Andromachi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us again for Research in Focus, and join us again for the next session.